coming today. Um, we're really excited to have Sydney Butts, uh, our current arts in residence, giving an artist talk today. Um, so um, Cindy is an uh, interdisciplinary visual artist and guitar dancer. She's based here in New York. Um, so don't worry, this isn't the last time you get to talk with her. Um, she's been here uh, since August 26, and she's finishing up her project. So she'll be glazing a little bit longer. Um, but she won't be with us too much longer. So if you have questions at the end of this, be sure to stop by and talk to her. Um, without any further ado, thank you, Cindy, for being here. And please take it away. Thank you Yay. so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I just want to make a short introduction about me um, so it's more clear what I'm doing. I definitely work interdisciplinary and project based. And um, I see myself primarily as a performance uh, artist. And um, I do body art, multimedia, and multisensory installation. And that includes video art, photography, olfactory art, and ceramics. Um, in my work, I often create uh, personas, and through them I tell forgotten histories, uh, social and political issues, and the effects on the human body. Um, my degree is, uh, I have a degree in art science. It's called Art and Context from the University of Berlin, uh, Germany. And I have my Bachelor's of Fine Arts in sculpture from the Aki Artes uh, in Schwede in the Netherlands. Um, I see um, my holistic practice and uh, my body conditioning as part of my art practice. So I do extensive Puto training, Noguchi training, <coughs> um, somatic research, um, somatic walking and different kind of dance techniques. and. Um, I also teach body and mind dancing. It's a it's a somatic based, um, more like a medical movement um, practice, and the marine flaming flaming elastics, which is uh, specifically um, a technique for the flexibility of the spine. Um, I teach at movement research and the New York Buddha Institute, and and I was. Um, Principal dancer of the Anjani Theater for eight years, and now I'm working with the New York um, Hutu Institute of New York. I just wanted to share some some key interests um, for me in my work is definitely um, human perception and uh, neuroscience research and uh, our five senses, and specifically I'm interested in transformation processes in the body, um, but that also translates for me into processes and um, society, religious or political processes. We were just talking about it, I'm from East Germany, so it, it's uh, something very close to me to see uh, a change from the communist uh, system to the um, democratic system, and now also comparing these two systems always in America, so this is part of my, um, let's say, analysis of the world. Um, I'm also very interested in time perception, uh, so the circadian rhythms, specifically in humans, and any kind of um, time-based um, work, chronometry, um, also memory formation, center memory development, collective memory, the collective subconscious, um, and that concludes for me in emotion theory and emotion research and sensory processing. I want to introduce uh, quickly four projects that I have been doing over the last two years, some are more recent, so you can see what interdisciplinary means to me. I just um, performed a Bhutto dance, solo dance piece um, at the New York Buto Institute Festival last weekend, and we saw it. Um, so it's definitely um, intense Buto training. I just wasn't, I've been training for 10 years, and I was just in Japan and trained with the son of the founder of Buto, and um, some really amazing dan other dance companies. So, um, for me, it's interesting how can I bring 
Caputo or the discipline of dance as a visual art. Then the other part of Hildegardus was a scent um, element. So I created um, an olfactory project and handed out little um, animals with an illustration from Hildegardus. Um, I will explain in a second who she is, but I can really give it around and you can smell. It's a frankincense-based um, scent. It's very strong because it's specifically for the theater. I wanted uh, to create an environment of like a church or cathedral. So Hildegard is based on the same Hildegard of Bingen, who was a nun in the 12th century Germany, who also became a saint um, later. She was very known for her uh, music, for her writings, illustrations, um, medical research, um, and her art. Then I introduced for the first time in this, in this dance project ceramic work. And I had, like, I, I based them off of illustrations from Hildegard of Bingen. And um, the other part for me is the installation part. It's, it's not really for me set design. It, the like my background is performance art, so the elements are a little bit different. It, it's just more like a feel of performance art. This is um, the opening scene of Saint Hildegard. That's the, the sculptural elements. Um, so what I, what's uh, specifically interesting about this illustration from Hildegard, she was very um, groundbreaking and, and very, forced, how do you say, like new in, for her time as a woman. She, um, in this illustration, she describes the, um, the world based on her religious views and, and, and drew that uh, image, <coughs> which really reminds of the, of the female private part. Um, she is also the, it looks like she is the first one who ever described the female orgasm. So she has been very interested in the <coughs> woman body, even though know, she was a nun at that time. And um, maybe if I go back in time. So the, the piece really starts with this scent, uh, frankincense, the, the scent, the religious scent of, of church, um, mm -hmm. sacred space. And then um, the piece starts. Yeah, I have another image here from Hildegard with the with the objects. Um, they're specific. They're actually uh, unfired clay, because I want to um, continue doing my research for this piece um, and see how unfired clay can carry the other fragrances and how long it can carry it. Olfactory installation. Um, let's see. Just a second piece. I just performed that last uh, last month in Dallas, and it's um, it's also a Bhutto piece, cutting the silver cord. Um, I developed as well a fragrance for it, and every audience member received a, a fan. And um, the silver cord in a metaphysical sense is the, is the connection of the dead body and, and the, maybe the spirit. And in my piece, it was about <coughs> doing the final cut of the body and the spirit. And um, this, this scent is um, Hiba-based scent, which is a very, very uh, rare Japanese uh, tree that uh, grows apparently only in Aomori. And, um, this audience was very new to Bhutto, and I wanted to share uh, a scent that is specifically from Japan and that I relate to Bhutto, because I was introduced to it the first time in a Bhutto training this summer in Japan. Um, so th these two fragrances are very smoke-based, smoky-based, and uh, I just wanted to share them because in my project here, I. Um, I, will, I, I started to develop objects that will hold fragrance, but they're going to be more in the direction of um, 
ozone or water. It's a specific term. I have to look it up. I just found it this morning. Petrichor. That that means when the um, the rainwater hits the soil or stone, that that specific scent that that you can smell, you know, like when rain comes, a beautiful smell. So I'm interested in that smell for my next project. Um, but I, so far, I have only my small projects for you to share. Mm -hmm. Then I want to talk about Summa Chimista, which is a um, character that I developed um, that, that travels in, in d different projects around the world and does healing performances. So um, the, the one aspect is the, is the actual performance where you can watch me perform in Summa Chimista, then the other part is uh, I've been doing extensive um, let's say, uh, training program with a doctor in somatic research. Um, her program is called Dynamic Embodiment, and, and we focus specifically on one-to-one -one, um, therapy, actually. Um, of course, in, in a performance, it, my, my sessions are performative. It's not a therapy session, but I think you can receive similar um, feelings or uh, uh, like a similar well-being after my performance and they, the, the performance are usually set up in a, in a multimedia setting like I have installation, video art, um, sound, light, um, props, costume. So I'm sharing that because I specifically applied here for like a, a project that is absolutely a multi-sensory multimedia environment for my performances. Just uh, one more. Um, oh yeah, the, the focus in Summa Achimista is uh, in calming the nervous system and spinal autonomy, personal encounter and human touch. And Usually, um, I do it like depending how many people are there and how long they want to stay there. It could be an hour to five, six hours per, per event. And um, some people stay with me for an hour, some people five minutes. And um, it's, a, it's a very interesting setting because me and the participant, we know we are being watched, but we're trying to be entering a very intimate um, relationship for that time and um, um, usually working non-verbal, there's no no talking, no only body communication and um, afterwards if the participant, participant wants me to, they can come to me and talk and share the experience with me or even the audience. It's usually um, almost like social structure afterwards people want to talk and share what they went through and what they experienced. Um, coffee performances. A little different, but also to me a social sculpture. Um, it's, it started with my interest in um, how there were times in East Germany where you couldn't get coffee. It was a, such a luxury. And there were even laws in, in, for example, in factories, no coffee allowed per day, or there were times you could have one coffee, there were weeks where you could have one coffee per week, um, you would get a lot of trouble if you had co forbidden coffee, and then at some point the government started punching, like mixing it with herbs. Um, it, my parents always said it was a terrible coffee, it was disgusting. <laughs> so it, it's a uh, for the Germans, um, the coffee and Kuchen side around 4 p.m. is always something very uh, amazing. I, I still love it. It's like very um, a cozy thing, and, and it's, it's like maybe a time to calm down and sit with your family, or, or just giving yourself a little like um, pleasant downtime. Um, so I was interested in, in comparing that to today, um, times of Starbucks. Um, do we still value 
that product and, and how, how can we value it and what is fair trade. So I started to um, do the coffee performances where I um, made my own dress and the dress serves as a filter. Mm -hmm. And um, so if you wanna co want to have a coffee, you have to receive it it's basically from between my legs. It's, it's a very <laughs> intimate thing. You have to sit, sit in front of me. I have spread legs, and um, as you can see, the dress here. Um, um, yeah, I've, it's re it's really intimate. It's very quite amazing. The, the contact that I have. I guess I'm really always looking for that contact with people and the performances. It's very fun and amazing. Um, but what's also very important in this is that uh, to me it's also a, a scent work because I grind the, the, the coffee fresh and you receive it fresh so after a couple hours um, you have that amazing smell but also because it's a different setting, it's a performance setting, people are more receptive, they want to talk, they want to share, they get excited and um, it becomes a social sculpture. I don't know if you guys uh, know. That I wrote here. It's inspired by Joseph Beuys. It's a concept of that uh, that uh, the potential of art can transform society. I don't know. That's a very known term. Yeah. And I was like, the, oh yeah. So in this one, I made my own coffee cups, my <laughs> ceramic cups. But in the very first one in Berlin, I actually got um, some, some um, they say like antique coffee cups from East Germany, which was pretty exciting. Like a, the father of a friend did everything for me to, to get like 50 or 60 year old cups from like an old factory, which is pretty rare to find something like that. So it was very special. So um, moving on to the project. Three, it, it ended up being three, four, five, I don't even know, projects, but the main project um, here I was working on is a, I call it the stalagmites, then um, the, the riverbed and the cells. I'm just going to move on to the stalagmites grotto. So I, I started with the idea I wanted an a, environment for potentially a performance. And um, I've been <coughs> last summer in, in a cave um, up, up state in Kingston, and that really stayed with me. And um, so I was researching about uh, stalagmite specifically and how one human touch, like one finger touch, the oil in your skin will ruin the growth of the stalagmite, at least for 30 years, most likely for forever. So you one touch of interest and passion for the nature actually destroys it. I thought that was very interesting. So I started playing with the idea of um, making them. Um, that was, uh, in during the process, I was like, maybe I need a diorama. It's like my, my kind of my mood board. Unfortunately, I couldn't go that big. But the <laughs> that would be the dream size. But these are like some of the um, test sizes I brought one here. I can talk about what I did with it. Um, so some of the bigger ones, and most of them have something like side pockets. And my plan is now to um, do what I said, the Petrichor sand. I want to um, infuse that into the object. So when you come close to the object, you, you can have that um, muddy, soily, wet sand. Um, and how I, uh, what I developed now, what I'm really excited about, I, I find it very interesting that, uh, so the stalagmite, you, you can s maybe smell in the cave, but you shouldn't touch. And for the ceramic object, it would be the same thing. You can smell, but you shouldn't touch. And um, the performance aspect will be that it will be guarded um, by me or any performance artist. So, uh, Maybe I should share a little bit about the process, right? Like, so we we're, um, I went pretty big, and when the first one actually came out really well, which is a paper clay stalagmite, and the other ones were a mix of uh, T1 and T1 paper clay, 
and I, I've had issues, um, two of the medium sized ones kind of exploded on me, so I don't know if they were still wet uh, to wet or if the mixture was not good, um, even though I, was, I heard it, it should be fine, but um, so I'm dealing with that, if anyone has an advice for me. <laughs> But I, I feel like I, I'm, I'm excited to, to, after the residency, to keep going and like, keep exploring. And Did you um, work with clay before? Me, yes. Okay. Yeah, but, but not such, such big pieces. And I have mm -hmm. never worked with paper clay before. Okay. So um, this is my tiny min miniature, very first stalagmite test. Um, looks a little bit like a witch hunt right now. <laughs> but what I did, um, this is, Cone 10 fired, and I wanted to see. This is not the future scent, but I put the this, this scent from the um, Hildegardis in it because I wanted to see how much a cone 10 can absorb because the porosity is only 1%. Right? Um, if, if you want it, it's a bit heavy. I am surprised that I let it soak over about two days. And don't, don't, well, I guess. It, it soaked it in, so it's fine now. The, the sand is in, in the top, it's like a little bowl inside the piece, if you can. So I, I am actually surprised that um, it really absorbed and, uh, and it, it still carries, which is exciting. But I think the, some of the pieces I'm going to fire cone 6, so the porosity is a little bigger, so it can absorb the future sand a lot better. Glazing, I don't know. <laughs> it's gonna mm -hmm. happen this week. I started, I, I envisioned them in different blacks and grays, um, maybe some accents of different color. So come visit me next week, we'll see how it goes. The riverbed. Um, the riverbed started because, so this summer I went to for the very first time after 10 years of training Buto, um, I finally made it to Japan and uh, went to study for one month. And this was a Buto training with uh, the dance company Sankai Duko in Toyama Prefecture. And we had um, a lot of the training in that week was on um, the idea of floating, being fluid, the sensation of floating or water. Um, also the Noguchi is, is really, it, it's the idea of you, almost like you replace your sensation of bones, fascia, muscles, organs, and replace it with water. And then we were next to a river, so I went every morning and every uh, lunch to explore the same movement in the water. And, and I, after, I haven't left New York in the summer for maybe nine years, and I, at first I was kind of like very nervous of not doing anything or just um, being in the river and not making anything productive out of it. But at some point, uh, my, my nervous system really started coming down and just receiving the sensation. And um, But then I noticed with uh, Simi Maho, one of the teachers, when we were like traveling around and looking at the nature, that many riverbeds are drying out. So I was becoming more interested in, in uh, of course, climate change, but like um, crazy heat that summer and, and change in nature and change in, in rivers. Um, so I developed the idea of a um, riverbed installation where I would, would perform in the center, but um, the different, the, the placement of the rocks would be um, like uh, the opportunity for the audience to sit with me and, and um, receive closer and um, like maybe breaking this uh, the difference between standing and maybe this judgmental watching to becoming one again together. So I, s um, I am maybe, this piece is also, the, my idea would be that uh, the water is obviously non-existent and it can be replaced with um, industrial, like an industrial, if you like a sand machine. So again, a water ozone kind of smell. Um, that's a 
the process of building. Um, I haven't before that I haven't built such large rocks. So I was talking with Adam and we, we decided on a skeleton in the middle, which worked really great for some of the smaller ones. Let's see. These guys are really the size. But I'm having issues with the large ones. There are there's too much tension at the moment in some area, so I'm dealing with some cracks and we'll see how how I could go on in the future with, with this building technique. Um, this is uh I'm I have two more like I have this week and next week, so I'm like the until sub Sunday I will go through all the glazing and um the glazing of the rocks, I'm more interested in an underglaze or like this feeling of pigment. Yeah, I was uh, when I was researching how I would imagine the color, I came across also like pigment collectors and people who really have the passion that they only do that. I get it was really new to me, but very exciting. I, I really love it how people like um, go every day or, or every weekend and go into the mountain and just collect and, and the process how they um, how do you say how they like uh, what's the technical term how to, to get the pigments out of the rocks uh, uh, excavate I think so yeah yeah so I mean I, this is another thing I would love like to do in my life <laughs> <laughs> but um, probably it's not gonna happen so I have to uh, find a way maybe with underglaze or like mud, mud lens to to um, get this uh, this kind of um, colors into the rocks. And then my last project that I want to talk about is the cells. Um, I've been playing with the cells for maybe two years, but I always have cracks the second I want to go bigger. And this time I was introduced to the um, the porcelain paper clay. So um, which I'm really excited about because I'm starting to be able to be go bigger and have no cracks. I started to uh, play with all kinds of um, different uh, surfaces I can work on, like parchment paper or the freezer paper, but I think I can share a bit more about that. But why am I doing it? Um, like in the first project, the Soma Shimista, where I specifically worked about the nervous system and the, the human spine, I, I'm i very um, interested in the cells of the bone, so and I realized that the bone tissue and specific diseases in, in bone tissues, they look quite similar to, to these um, cells that I'm creating. So in the future, once I go larger and have a bunch of them, I, they, I, they will serve as a video projection surface. We have uh, one film still that I started, which is like simple movement, uh, video looping on the cells. How do you make those? These? Mm -hmm. It's just a porcelain paper slip. And do you and use you like the dripping? Dripping, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, I love the dripping. It's it's something very uh, calming and, and meditative. It's, it's a little bit obsessive. I don't know. <laughs> so but how big are those, for example? Maybe like this. Big okay. One. I I know that I I know there's this one Dutch artist. I don't know how he does it, but he has pieces like this big, but it's more like sprinkled, and I can I, I can't figure it out. I. Um, I've tr like I said, um, the yeah. parchment paper works best so far because it doesn't ob really absorb the water. It's very oily and greasy, and then the second you put it on, it's, it's almost like uh, how you say, like pushing the clay away. The any other paper is getting too wet, and then it starts uh, once it dries, starts cracking everything. The the um, the burlap put could maybe be interesting if you fire it with the burlap, but it also was cracking a lot. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone has an idea. You, you can mm -hmm. use the plasterboard when you do it, you know, squeeze out the plasterboard? 
Yeah, Even on the plasterboard. Yeah, I, I the always use the plasterboard when I was drinking. Um, I have tried but this ju with just porcelain slip. Oh, just paper porcelain. I use paper porcelain. Yeah. Mm. yeah, okay. Because with it, it's just porcelain, which I didn't know before the residency, mm. it would always crack the second you go bigger. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, maybe I could see. You, could so you think it wouldn't crack? Mine is not much crack. Yeah. Mm. But if you do a lot of layers, then maybe, you know. But usually, you know, it was fine. Okay. Yeah. You can fire off the plasterboard. Yeah, right? I always do. No, no, you can't. 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 How do you transport it though when it's really big onto the? Oh, because it's when drag a little, mm. then you can use it just enough. Mm. Like you know, when you make in a cookie, you know, kind of thing, you on a, you, you bake a cookie, then when you, you know, use a spatula kind of thing, mm. then you can just lift it off, then. Okay. Try it. Try it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very simple. Yeah. Even a big size like this. Yeah, you can do I think bigger size too. Yeah, I, I have a dream to go this way. So, um, actually, I don't know what time it is. This is already. Uh, I thought it'd be back. Okay. I was super fast. Yeah. Well, you can finish up and we can do questions. Yeah. Well, I can maybe. There's one more image here. I um, I like doing dioramas for my performances. Usually, it's not with clay, but I I had a lot of fun to prepare little islands um, or little like uh, hills and, and then I have like the architectural figurines to, to help me to um, plan the mood for my performance pieces for the installation. So what are these images? Yeah. Um, this, is a, the, this is a diorama. This I, I've done um, three, you know, four years ago, I've done a performance piece in Germany um where I say I, I had like a large pile of coal and I had to rearrange it and, and um, the process was about um, nostalgia and nostalgic thoughts and how you can <coughs> reorder your thoughts in, in, your, in your brain. So um, this is a very similar image for me. the pile was a little bit smaller but ideally I would, Re redo the performance with a really large pile, so that that helps me to visualize, yeah, like like a maquette or so. And then the center image is um, the internal of one of the stalagmites, how I built them. Mm -hmm. And then there's an internal <laughs> of the Kill and Moby with Caitlin yeah. <laughs> trying to figure out because I was building pretty <laughs> big and high in the beginning, but it just it just fit. Mm -hmm. And the tallest one uh, survived perfectly. And yeah. Um, it worked for mm -hmm. And then what another, I, I didn't share photos. I um, tried one Berla project because I was able to take Lisa's class one Wednesday, which was really exciting for me, where I just, um, I have a bunch of um, sheets, like, a, like about a paper size. And um, I'm like, I made, I say you, I brushed all of the paper, all of the burlap with the porcelain paper, sli paper slip, and then the idea is that it will be more like a um, transcript papers with very like fragile um, information. So most likely a decal later on the pieces. So that I have that on downstairs. If anyone is interested in seeing that, and um, that's it. I have like three more cents that I that I find exciting potentially for the um, what I was talking about um, water hitting mm -hmm. soil or water hitting stone so if you want to I can start giving them passing them around
How do you agree to research in sand? What do you do for sand oils? Um, it's all essential oils in alcohol. And um, I collect scents. And um, I'm, I'm doing like, a, I'm, I'm testing them after like a specific formula. So, so you're actually mixing? Yeah. No. How does that process work? How, like, what can you walk us through? How you develop a scent? Sure. <laughs> Maybe like the the intro version to it. Yeah. So I um I start with the basically like a like a sheet with like the base note, middle and top note, and for each you can in the in the beginning to find a very basic scent or feeling for me. Um, I do three for each, uh, but you can you can go crazy and make six, seven, nine per per category, and then um, the way I do it, I have like a tiny um, glass bowl, and I go really drop by drop. I um, the the base uh, I I pick what I think what I want. Like I have a bunch of strips on the side. Uh, usually when I start a new one, I do. Like let's say I have this boo hoo hoo, and I do one drip on the on the paper, and then I s I, I see I, I combine them under my nose and wave them and see what what I think fits for the specific project, and then once once I make that decision, what's going to be the base, the middle note and the top note, I, I start um, combining them in the alcohol. And um. Yeah. I I learned I had like one workshop <laughs> with, um, with um the woman uh her, her name is I think Juliet, I don't know her last name right now, but she has her, her brand is called Ashimology and um I did one workshop with her where she taught me how to um find the right dos dosage, um, yeah. you know, like you, you, ideally you do one drop, close it, really shake it, and then you do the test strip and combine it, mm. and then you can see what's the next drop. So in the beginning you go mild, there's like a 18 to 24 drops per valve, but then um, you can um, multiply and, and see if some of them are going to be less or more. So the pieces that I'm doing, because they're not for really for wearing them, they're really really strong. Like mm -hmm. ideally, you know, if you if you smell that in the theater where I was working, mm -hmm. there was sixty people, and it was freshly sprayed, so you could you could smell it in the whole room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and whereas whereas with the feathers that you did is a little bit more an intimate mm -hmm. thing. So I I try to also make that really um, I would say like a key decision. How I want people to smell it. Yeah. Or how I want to it. Yeah. 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 Cindy, of course, these smells don't have a lasting in my temperature. The essential based ones are about two hours. They say two hours. Still, a longer, but I mean, this one has been up to 10 days. I don't know. I was lucky. But that's in the fan. In the fan. Yeah. yeah. Right, but I, I did another test uh, with, with the bisque fire and I still also stayed up to 10 days. Mm -hmm. So bisque fire also more oh, for Right. Mm -hmm. So you're putting it on after they're fired. You're putting them on yes. before. You're putting it on after. After. Yeah. after. Of course, it would. It's a, it's a little time intensive if it would. If it would be in the gallery, people, I and mean, I have had shows where I worked with scent and then the uh, assistant of the gallery had to like do the drops every day or every two days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, do you have a favorite company for the scents or are there specific companies that you work for? Um, I don't have a favorite one. Um, <laughs> what? No, the oil or the scent. No, uh, I'm still I'm still exploring and going through different companies. I don't have anything. Really you don't make them directly. I mean, from scratch. Oh, I wish, but no, yeah. it's impossible. Mm -hmm. 
There is a big company only for those perfuming. There are many, yeah. 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 Like yeah. seven or eight different yeah. companies that mm -hmm. they buy from. Mm -hmm. It gets also pretty expensive. So um, <coughs> actually this one, the Hiba wood, um, so I bought that in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, and th it, this, I don't know, that. it's a smaller bottle than this one. It was about $30 per bottle and I was like, uh, but it was, it's so perfect for that one project. So I wanted to buy more and a few, if you want to buy it online somewhere in America, the bottle is over $120. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's a, I didn't know that it's this rare, but um, I don't know how it would work in like really large scale work if I would have to go to synthetic uh, fragrances. I, I, I haven't done that yet. So. How, would you, how would that world obtain? The Hiba oil is, from, is, a, is a tree mm, from wood. What are your next steps for this installation that you're planning? <laughs> is that a scary question? I can take it back. No, I, I know that the stalagmites, I will finish getting them. Mm -hmm. And then I will bring them my, to my studio and will um, most likely do a, a video performance about uh, the, like a the attempt of touch, mm -hmm. just like my I, my style is super slow usually in my performance. Like, uh, um, uh, I do buto, mm -hmm. but I, in my own performance art, it's not buto because for me buto is still a dance technique and or, or can also be very theatrical. But my my pure performance art is 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 not buto, but it has elements of the slowness. I have. It's true, but it's it's less emotional. It's no choreography. And it's so you know, your performance is related about outer work with your self or kind of relationship, memory. Okay, can you repeat? Oh, I don't. I don't understand. No, please, it's because you yourself, yeah, and the outer work, yeah. So kind of in a relationship through those kind of in a sense. Bridge. Mm -hmm. That is the sense. Yes. That, that is the you know, what you want to yeah. try. In performance art? Yeah, yeah. Or social, any you know, issues or certain it depends on? Yeah, I would say social is issues. The, 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 I have always different topics in mm -hmm. the performance mm -hmm. artworks. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I'm really looking for exchange afterwards. And, um, mm -hmm. Usually I always have uh, a conversation with people afterwards. Mm -hmm. and right. But but first it's like this internal process. Mm -hmm. Like it's like maybe a, some sort of deep listening and understanding mm -hmm. and um, through time and through repetition of movement, kind of like freeing your mind mm -hmm. into like um, wouldn't call it Zen, but uh, mm -hmm. like a, a positive emptiness. And I don't know, I, it seems like the way I perform, people can receive that. I, I don't know how it's magic. Wait, will you show your finished work here? Here? You will, in the, res in the group residence show. Yes. But no, <laughs> performance. Probably not. But you'll keep us informed when you do have performances, and we'll put it on the message center so everyone knows. It is true. How do you <laughs> but the of practice affected your work? I mean, did it create? Were you doing these kinds of things before you started practicing Bhutto? Did it start with the class? Yes, I did it. I, I, the slowness, I did it before. Um, the Bhutto helped me to be uh, physically more strong. And it helped me to work on my presence as a performer. Like a training. Of course, she doesn't believe me, but I told her I'm, I'm pretty shy. Um, but going through all kinds of different scenarios in Bhutto training and in Bhutto performance in the dance company, it, it really helped me to understand, to already know what my body is capable of. So I, because I have maybe experienced something before in a training, so it doesn't get scary in a performance art piece if something is live 
you know, sometimes I try to really go over the limits with some stuff, and, and then, I, then I know I can trust myself. So that's what Budo helped me with. And um, the, all the somatic training that I've been doing the last three years is more medical-based to really understand what's going on in certain situations. It's more like neuroscience, and um, that helped me to... Um, to really understand and find the right words about my work, I would say, about body work. Yeah. Is the guard figure in your stalagmite performance um, an authority representing protecting the environment? Yes. Not, not some kind of government authority? No. Or the earth, like yeah, okay. it's more from the um, eco-feminism kind of mm -hmm. point of view. The female healer. I have that a lot in my work. Mm -hmm. I I find the word healer a little risky because it sometimes fits in a category, but it, it, it works. It, it's easier. Any moment it it's helps. Kind of ritual. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's yeah. it can be pretty ritualistic, mm -hmm. a little mystic. Mm -hmm. Do you have synesthesia? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes I think. <laughs> I, this is like I studied this in my program as well, and I compared with my best friend, and she has it really strong. And then after that, there was when she explained to me what's going on with her, I felt like no, probably not. But mm -hmm. I don't know. Synesthesia has a range from zero to one hundred. So literal synesthesia, people really feel and smell, but metaphorically, we all can relate to this. Right. I mean, I have, especially with smell, like always very strong images coming up, um, could be like object images. Or, uh, you know, I know the synesthesia is not just the, the color and the uh, mm -hmm. Exactly, so, I don't know. It's exciting to explore, maybe. Is there, um, like, a, a memory uh, like a specific memory uh, tied to nostalgia for you that really got you interested in the idea of nostalgia? Mm -hmm. Growing up in East Germany the first <laughs> eight years really strongly, I, yeah. yeah. I, it's really, maybe you guys have heard of the term nostalgia, like uh, nostalgia, like that the, mm -hmm. every East German is too nostalgic for East, East German times. Sometimes I feel I have it. Um, I don't know. But one one very triggering moment for me I th that it always comes back is um, my my parents had this this weekend house in the forest and there was also this other old um, lady living in this like kind of like a witchy house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I always went there every day to hang out with her because she had herbs everywhere, everything smelled so strong and, and she knew everything, all the mushrooms, all the herbs, she had an amazing garden, she cooked. Mm -hmm. um, my parents didn't have much time for me, they were always working on the house, so I <laughs> stayed with her the whole time and, and that, that, it's still that, that um, kitchen comes up a lot, so my, my mm -hmm. something happened there with the scent. Have you worked with the scents of dried herbs? No, I haven't. Some of them are so strong. Yeah. Any Actually, I, I have one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, one piece. I, I had um, I had like a, a solo show, but I invited five women from very different professions to work with me on nostalgia. And I, I set up one room with all kinds of herbs and spices and um, like different gemstones. And she, I invited her for like the duration of the performance. She was performing for the first time ever to um, smell and, and taste. And what and then in relationship to ship to that, I wanted to go. I wanted her to go through all kinds of people she could remember she met her in her life. It's called a Dumba number, how many people you can actually remember um, or have social interaction with. And 
she really because she's actually in, in management and business and she was very strategic the way it was like this plan this came up this plan that came up and um yeah she that was very specific uh, just uh let's see herbal and how that triggers specific numbers in combination with people Anyone else have a question? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're pretty on time. So <laughs> thank, thank you, Cindy. <laughs>